So like I said, the, the, the sum of today's presentations, I'd really like to be consumed as a whole. And, and really, if I, if I could redo the schedule, this would be the last one. Why? Because you know, in, in the earlier presentations, we're, we're finding about money management. We're finding about you know, when specific strategies trade. This one is a little bit more about you know, the actual mechanics of entering that position and what different levels of leverage can really mean for your trading account and in the end your trading performance, obviously. So we're going to be looking at a lot of the same data, but I, I hope to put a, a couple of twists on there to make you really understand about what using leverage effectively means and what different kinds of, kinds of uh, risk-reward profiles you're looking at when you're looking at different levels of leverage on your account. Obviously, even though we're talking about improving your chances, there is substantial risk in this market. Don't trade, with it. Don't trade on leverage with anything other than risk capital because you could lose it all just as easily as you could make some money. So, you know, that being said, this is a risky market. Please do your homework. Please control risk. And obviously, that, this is what all these presentations have been about, but it definitely bears repeating. Again, hypothetical performance done in, with the benefit of hindsight. So I really believe in everything I'm, I'm telling you today. And, and I put together all this work, all this quant work, uh, with maximum thought and maximum, you know, as a quant, as a back tester, as a forward tester, what have you, I always try to make systems that have the best chance of su succeeding in the future. So I don't like to over-optimize my charts. I don't like to pick these, uh, th these really random rules that are unlikely to work in the future. By the same token, just because something's worked in the past, and even if it is grounded in logic, you could still lose. So please control risks and p please be aware of those risks and aware of the limitations uh, therein in hypothetical performance numbers. So leverage. What is leverage? I mean, pretty simply, the simplest, you know, back to the caveman, really simple. You have a fulcrum, you have a lever, you put it over that, you put it over that fulcrum, you lift that gigantic wheel. The little guy is lifting something probably eight times his weight. And I want, I want you to think about trading like that. You know, in, in the US, you're able to trade with up to 50 to 1 leverage. But just because you have a Ferrari doesn't mean you, you go down the, the highway at 200 miles per hour. You know, you crash, you're a dead man. And I, I kind of want, you know, that's the extreme example. But at the same time, it, I think it's apt to make the anal analogy. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you have to understand what using a leverage effectively means. And again, putting, it, putting the pieces all together and making a system that really has a chance of success. So just like the little guy is lifting you know, something eight times his size, you can lift something 50 times your size. You can control a position 50 times your margin requirement. But it doesn't really mean you should. And we're going to talk about what using leverage effectively means. And I've shown this chart two or three times today already, but again, I, I don't mind being a little repetitive here because the whole point, the whole drive beyond, behind these five presentations that I'm doing today is basically that FXCM is making client profitability numbers known. Uh, myself and our marketing team has been making a big push of making traders really aware of the, the cold hard facts. And you know, again, the raw data isn't pretty. Here we have a chart. The chart shows that on, on the y-axis, you see the percentage of traders that were profitable in trading that particular currency pair in a given quarter. And that red line, 50%. So all those bars below the red line mean that there are more traders unprofitable in that specific currency pair through that quarter than those that turned a profit. And that's a problem. That's a problem for me personally because my team puts together research on dailyeffects.com and if what we're doing is just encouraging people to lose money, you know, it's just not, not a great place to be. So if you can understand the why and the how do we improve our chances, you can go a long way in improving your chances of actually turning a profit. And I've said it a million times today, but you're in this to make money. You're not in this for the cheap thrill because you get free cocktails at the crab's table. 
So at the end of the day, you can't make money. You know, it's just not really worth your while. It's not really spending the time away from everything else you do. So just keep all these things in mind so we can improve chances of success. Again, I showed this chart again today, uh, a couple times today. Same 13 currency pairs as the previous chart. The really interesting thing is, this chart shows you what percentage of trades are closed out at a profit. So that 50% mark is right at the middle of my chart. It basically shows you that, for the most part, traders are closing out trades at a profit. You know, for example, in the Euro US dollar pair, which is by far our most popularly traded pair, approximately 58% of all trades within this year stretch were closed out at a profit. How does this reconcile with the fact that most traders lost money? Pretty simple. Comes down to money management. And that's what I talked about this morning. And if nothing else, realize that you don't want to be part of the herd. The herd just moves, wanders around in different directions, goes, you know, herd could wander into slaughter all at the same time. And though that's an extreme analogy, you know, you kind of want to be aware of the pitfalls of the common trader so you can yourself have a much better chance of not being part of that herd and actually giving your, yourself a decent shot at success. Zooming in, you know, so the, the previous chart showed you the average gain per winning trade, the average loss per losing trade, and I'm, I've zoomed in here to the Euro US dollar pair. On average, through this year stretch, traders made money on 58% of all Euro US dollar trades. However, those winning trades only produced 65%, uh, 65 pips of average profit. The losers produce 127 pips of average losses. That's a big problem. Even if you're making money on 58% of your trades, if you're looking at that kind of risk reward, you're going to do poorly. So we've been talking about this, and we've been talking about money management, controlling losses, letting profits run. That's critical, and that's really important. But another really critical part is leverage. Why? Because when, you're, when you expose yourself to large losses, large losses add up way faster than you can offset them with con con consecutive winners. And I think this table does, does a great illustration of this. You know, just by the law of numbers, if you have two, 5%, if you lose 5% of your account, let's say you start out with 10,000 US dollars in your account, your first trade, you lost 5% of your account, okay, you're down to 9,500. Your second trade, you lose another 5%, you're down to 9,025. You'd need five consecutive winners to then make, to get back to break even. That's substantial, and that's a really big problem. If you're risking twice what you stand to gain, and you're trading with leverage, you're digging yourself a really big hole, especially if you have a couple of consecutive losers that you'll need much more than 60%, 58% average profitability per trade to actually make back that capital. And at the end of the day, that's what we're interested in. That's why you're all here. That's why a lot of people traveled from all over the world just to, to try to get this information. I'll go back to my RSI strategy, and maybe all of those who have been in each of my presentations are getting tired of it, and I apologize. But again, I, I love the RSI strategy because it's a great proxy for what our traders actually do. If you look at the data, there's a great correlation between the RSI strategy and what our traders are actually trading. That is to say, the RSI buys something that's really cheap, sells something that's expensive, I think that's kind of human nature. I think that's what, or I know that that's what most of our traders do. And in understanding when the RSI works and when it doesn't work, you give yourself a much better chance of success if you do fit that mold, if you do fit the, the mold of the average uh, retail trader. So just to reiterate, and I've showed this animation a couple of times already, but it's worth pointing out again. The RSI strategy tends to produce fairly consistent profits when markets are favor in, in favorable state, if markets aren't really going, going much anywhere, the RSI is going to, to produce pretty high percentage winners, modest winners. Unfortunately, when, client, when markets break out, all of that profit is for nothing because it's all out the window, especially in especially volatile markets. Again, we'll, we'll go back to the, the summary of the RSI trading strategy through a specific stretch of time because I think it is a good representation of what our clients are actually doing. So this is the RSI trading strategy on a Euro-US dollar 60-minute chart from 2002 to 2010. 
approximately 62% of all trades were profitable. In theory, uh, given the hypothetical back test, unfortunately, the average winner only produced 94 pips in profit. The average loser was nearly twice that, which gave us an average loss on a per trade basis. This is a problem. This is remarkably similar to what we're seeing from our clients. Our clients are actually making money just about, you know, not quite 60% of the time in our sample, but pretty close. And yet the average loser is more than twice that of the average winner. This problem becomes magnified when you're talking about leverage. So something we did when we were talking about money management and just you know, treating that specific symptom, when we talked about fixing the fact that traders took profits too quickly, let losses run too long, we put fixed prof profit targets and stop loss on the RSI strategy. So the RSI strategy, you know, the line in blue represents the base strategy. The line in orange represents what was the best back-tested result using stops, fixed stops and limits. So we see that risk-adjusted returns improve substantially when we start using stops and limits on the RSI strategy. And if you remember back, if you were watching my presentation this morning, you know that we recommended at least a reward to risk ratio of one to one. That is to say, stand to gain at least as much as you stand to lose on a per trade basis, and you really increase your chances of success. And just looking at a back test on the dollar Swiss franc pair, the risk adjusted returns improve substantially when we use those fixed stops and limits. That's only part of the equation, however. One of the real issues with, with the RSI and You'll notice that, I'm going to take a step back again. You'll notice the fact that even when you are using stops, you do, see, you do tend to see pretty extended losing streaks. And that's a real issue. When we start talking about percentage numbers, again, if you have a lot of consecutive losers that are a big chunk of your account, it's really difficult to make it back up to break even. It's really difficult to erase all those losses when they pretty much add on each other. So it's really important to, to know one important characteristic about the RSI. And again, we're treating it as a, not a perfect proxy, but a really good proxy for our, what our clients actually do. We're using it as a proxy. What does the RSI strategy ev do even when we're using stop loss, stop loss levels? So again, to, to just brief recap of what the RSI stra trading strategy does, it buys something that's oversold, sells something, sells something that's overbought. Problem is, something can remain oversold for a long time, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. I mean, you see that the euro dollar rallied into this and just continued losing, and if you see the indicator at the bottom, I apologize if it's a little bit difficult to see, but the indicator at the bottom, okay, we're in oversold territory, overbought territory to start, and then we hit oversold. So you're buying each time this RSI crosses back above oversold. Problem is, even if you're using stop losses, and we are in this case, you can, if you can squint your eyes a little bit, you can see that we are using stop losses here. Problem is, it's really streaky, and you can continue losing if markets remain oversold for a long time. And this is where leverage really comes into play. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to have your bad, your, your losing streaks. It's, you know, a fact. You want to prepare for those losing streaks as best you can so your bankroll isn't gone, your trading capital isn't gone. And the biggest way to do that is just talking leverage. Or in my opinion, the, the best way to do that is, is talking you know, about leverage and what you're actually putting at risk. So that equity curve is a, a very simple back test of, again, the RSI strategy on a US dollar Swiss franc pair 60-minute chart going back to about 2005. This is one-to-one -one leverage, which is to say we started with 10,000 US dollars. Over here, you can't see the $10,000 mark, but it's there. We started with $10,000 on day one. And overall, anything above $10,000 is basically the gravy here, what we theoretically would have made in terms of profits. So you see that, in theory, we would have peaked over 16,000 in 2009, which was, again, a great year for the RSI. But we would have seen pretty substantial losses thereafter. And really what we're getting at is the fact that from the peak of about 16500 we lost you know, $2,500, which doesn't hurt too much if we started at 10000 and we're now at 14000 I mean, you know, 
4,000 profit on a $10,000 investment. Not insane, it's not crazy, but it's, it's still respectable. We're on one-to-one -one leverage, not bad. So let's dial, up, dial it up a notch. That was on one-to-one leverage. We'll go to two-to-one here. And what I want you to draw your attention to is the y-axis here. All of a sudden, we start at 5,000 US dollars to start with. And our peak, you know, we basically nearly triple our money closer to the 14,000 mark. Fantastic. Of course, you know, when you're talking about starting with $5,000, Hypothetical back tests are always done with, with the benefit of hindsight. So had you started in 2005 with $5,000, you could have nearly tripled your money, in theory, by trading the RSI strategy on the dollar Swiss franc. Problem is, you don't really know where you're going to start on this, this uh, equity curve, let's say. Markets are fairly unpredictable. And you could have started up here. You could have started at the, the, the tallest peak of this equity curve, and you could be suffering through a fairly substantial drawdown. So if you're starting with $5,000, all of a sudden, okay, fine, our peak is near 12,000, but we're closer to 9,000 right now, and that's 60% of your capital. That's a $3,000 loss if you're starting on two to one leverage, trading one standard 10K lot per $5,000 in your account. Four to one, again, I mean, we're starting on 2,500 US dollars uh, on day one, the beginning of 2005, in theory, we could have gotten well above $8,000, which is a fantastic return on our investment, in theory. Problem is, you don't know where on this equity curve you're starting. So, had we started, basically, when the strategy was at its absolute best at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, we would be down pretty substantially. And to further highlight the fact, again, if you had started when the strategy was doing the best, which, you know, human nature, you say, oh, this strategy has been fantastic. Let's put some money in it. It's really easy to say that just intuitively. Like, I want to go with a winner here. Again, let's go back to the chart. 2009 was a blockbuster year for this strategy. You know, it's really difficult to say that you wouldn't be attracted to this. I, I certainly am. You know, with that kind of track record, you can get really excited. Problem is, you're trading four to one leverage. You start when the strategy is at its absolute best you get completely wiped out. So the beginning of our uh, y-axis up here, $2,500, four to one leverage, we're trading 10K lots to start. Problem is, our bankroll is gone once we cross below the zero mark. So already you're kind of getting a sense for, for leverage, and this is kind of a crude example because leverage is fixed, or, well, leverage, that's not true. Leverage is variable, and not based on a, on a percentage of your account. I want to introduce the concept of effective leverage and really using the fact that you're using good money management to fine tune your leverage and determine how much you're able to lose on a particular trade and what kind of effect that might have on your trading system. So I wanna introduce a, a concept here. I wanna base my leverage based on my stop loss. So every time I open a trade, I wanna say I am able, I am willing to risk in this example, 5% of my account on a given trade. So again, we're sticking to the RSI strategy. We're sticking to the stop loss and profit target from our earlier presentation on you know, range trading and money management. So we're, we're standing to lose about 115 pips per trade. And if we want to translate that to 5% of our account, if, we're ha if we have $100,000 to begin with, that's $5,000. A stop loss of 115 pips, given an average pip cost, and you can see that directly on your, your quotes window, would give us a stop loss in, on a per lot basis of $101. This is, this is a little bit different because it's a Swiss franc. If it's a US dollar pair, so if it's, if it's the euro US dollar, a pip equals $1 on a 10K lot, a little simpler. But for this example, 115 Swiss franc pips equal $101. My maximum risk in US dollars is $5,000, which represents 5% of my account. So to find out the number of lots or the effective leverage I can use on my account, given the fact that I'm risking 5% of my account on a per trade basis, I take that $5,000 and I divide it by the per lot maximum loss, and that gives me the number of lots. In this case, it's 49 lots, which is substantial. When you're talking about uh, 
$100,000 account, $100,000 account, and you're trading 49 lots, that's 490,000, that's virtually five to one, given a stop loss of 115 pips. That's pretty aggressive. And we're gonna see in a second what that means in terms of actual returns on a strategy if we use this general rule that we're risking X percentage of our account on a per trade basis. So pretty simply, we've, we've shifted from a fixed stop limit, uh, well actually, we, we're keeping the fixed stop, but we've shifted from a fixed uh, trade size and instead use this more variable trade size. So let's say I risk 5% of my account on a per trade basis on the, the RSI strategy. This is a chart, or this is an equity curve. On the y-axis, you have theoretical equity. You're starting with, you know, in this case, 100K, but in, the, oh, yep, you're starting with exactly 100K, and you're using the previous formula to figure out how many lots you can trade. And that number changes depending on your capital. So the equity curve is going to change pretty substantially. So given the fact that the RSI strategy was relatively successful, at least in theory, on the dollar Swiss franc going back a number of years, you see that using this technique could have resulted in substantial uh, gains through to 2009. So if I risk 5% of my account every time, you know, at the very beginning, I'm trading 49 lots at the same time and that effect is cumulative as my equity builds. So I'm taking 5% of my open account equity and I'm pressing the bet essentially. It's kind of an anti-Martingale system, uh, if that makes any sense. If we check that out, you know, in theory, if you started with $100,000 in 2005, you could have theoretically reached nearly $1.2 million at the end of 2010, or at the end of 2009, excuse me. Obviously, this is a, a paperback test it doesn't mean that you actually would have achieved these results, but it probably would have been pretty close. Problem is that right after that, you know, the, the trading strategy does really poorly, and just as easily as you made that $1.2 million on your initial investment or multiplied your account 13 times, you lost it just as quickly, and actually you would have negative equity right now. That's a big deal. That, when you're talking about risk-adjusted returns and what you really stand to gain, when you consider that you don't know what point of the equity curve you're really starting at, it's really important to know that risking more capital, yes, it could multiply your gains, but if you're, tr you're using this concept of using, risking a percentage of your account, those losses can add up really fast. And at 5%, again, you know, that looks fantastic on the way up. On the way down, not so much. Let's see what happens when we vary that percent a little bit. So, same concept, we're doing 2.5% of our account. So if the 5% the of our account ri risks 49 lots on the dollar Swiss franc on day one, this one would risk at, uh, approximately 24 or 25, whichever is, is the closest is how I coded it. It would trade 24 lots on the first trade and that would vary as a percentage of equity. Notice something here, it's, it's actually really interesting here. Notice that you started from a higher entry point into you know, basically the, the best track record, the best time for the RSI trading strategy. Notice that you started from a higher point because you weren't leveraging your account that much into what was actually a pretty bad time for the RSI trading strategy. And the most interesting thing is here that even though you're risking less of your account, that peak is pretty close. I mean, in theory, again, risking 5% of your account at a time you know, you would have had approximately $100,000 mid-2009. In theory, $1.2 million, $1 million sometime later. If you started with that same 100 k just a few years ago, and again, we're starting at the same point, but just risking 2.5% of your account, the peak is pretty darn close, and that drawdown, it's still pretty nasty, let's be honest here, but that drawdown is substantially less you know, painful, given the fact that you were so high. So already you're seeing that there's a trade-off here. Your peaks aren't as big, but your troughs aren't as deep. So once you start varying that 5% to 2.5%, you almost get to the same spot, and you stand to lose much less on the way down. Let's vary a little bit more. Let's be honest here, you know, risking 5% of your account 
and theoretically achieving nearly $1.2 million on a 100K investment. Sounds fantastic. At 2.5%, at we almost got there. At 1.5%, we didn't really get there. It wasn't really close. But at the same time, you know, look at what happened ever since the equity curve took a turn south. And again, we're, we're working on the assumption, and it's, it's not a far-fetched assumption. We're working on the fact that you don't know when you're going to enter the market. Again, it's human nature, I think, to, to bet on something that's worked really well. In this case, the RSI strategy did fantastically well in 2009. But you, know, you can think of reasons, just looking at it in hindsight, why that worked out so well. But there was no great way to know at the time. So with that in mind, pay attention to the fact that, OK, fine, we didn't achieve the same peaks in equity. But at the same time, you know, we started 2005 with 100 k in theory, in 2009 at our peak, we could have gotten a little bit over 400K in our account. So basically took 100K to 500,000 because that, that y-axis is the amount above your initial starting capital. So you're talking about five times your, your, your initial investment. It's fantastic. This is all hypothetical, and this is best case scenario, by the way. On the turn south, you don't lose nearly as much as you did on the earlier examples. And granted, you know, you didn't stand to gain nearly as much either, but you know, you still have a substantial amount of your stake left. And you start, let's say you started with 100K in 2005, right now you're around 200K, so you're still actually at a pretty decent profit, given even one of the nastiest drawdowns in the, the strategy's history. Obviously, you know where this is going, we can vary it even further, 1%, but that line is a whole lot smoother then that 5% mark, I mean that 5% mark, again, if we know how to time this strategy perfectly, and I can tell you that the RSI strategy is going to do fantastically well, I wouldn't be here, A. And B, we could make a lot of money. Problem is, you don't know when it's going to turn south, and that's what I really want to emphasize. So you want to prepare for that, so that you do have, you, you know, you do have pretty good, risk, uh, good chances of success if the strategy does well. But on the downside, you're not going to lose all your capital because the strategy hits a drawdown. And again, you know, if you're starting with 100K, you hit 200K around here. That's 200K of profits, 300,000 in your account. You're tripling your account. That's a pretty good hypothetical return. I'd sell for that. And you're losing a fairly insignificant portion of that relative to the other ones. And finally, you have half of a percent risk per trade. I'm not telling you how to trade. And one of the, I, I think one of the most important takeaways from this presentation is that there are no absolutes in trading. If you do start with capital you wouldn't miss if it was gone, you know, great. You, know, you, can, you can try and lose, use a lot of leverage. But at the same time, know that you're putting your capital at pretty substantial risk of complete loss within a short period of time if that strategy doesn't start out the gates on a roll. So, you know, that 0.5% equity curve doesn't even register on the scale practically. But it's remarkably consistent. And, you know, you're not looking to make a million bucks literally. But at the same time, if you're starting with 100K and, and you do make, you know, I'd, I'd say around 50K of profits throughout that stretch, that's not awful either. And that drawdown is actually fairly reasonable. So if nothing else, I want you to understand that with, with higher risk comes higher reward, sure, but it's not really possible. And if it were possible to know exactly how well a strategy is going to do, A, you wouldn't be here. B, you would be one of the richest people on earth. So when you're looking at this like a business, as you should, as, as something where you can generate profit, if you put in the work, if things work in your favor, you do want to think of this as a business, you know, fine, I could triple my money in not so much time, but I could just as easily lose it. And actually, that's fairly likely that you lose it if you risk too much of your capital at the same time. Again, I can't tell you which one to pick, but at the same time, I do need you to be aware that the more you risk per trade as, as a percentage of your account, the bigger those peaks and those troughs are going to be, and the faster you can lose all of your equity. If we see a table breakdown here, again, we, we reached nearly $1.2 million in maximum equity if we started on 5%, or if we risk 5% of our account per trade. Problem is, that maximum drawdown 
is bigger than our maximum equity. That is to say that at our peak, we had 1.18 million or 1.19, so round it, million, hypothetically, in profits in our trading account. Problem is that the maximum drawdown is more than that, and the final equity is actually negative. One, two measures I like looking at is a, a statistical thing. It's a standard deviation. Monthly standard deviation of returns, that kind of gives you a rough sense of how much you're risking on a monthly basis, roughly. That's super high, that's over, that's 10,000, or sorry, $106,000 on a monthly basis. And the sharp ratio, I don't need you to pay too much attention to, but basically it's your final equity over uh, the standard deviation of those returns, gives you a good proxy for risk adjusted returns. 2.5%, the peak is pretty darn similar. We go to 1.05, our drawdown is substantially less, uh, the standard deviation less, and we actually hypothetically produce a profit at the end. 1.5%, you know, fine, the max equity isn't quite as high. Check out the final equity though, it's pretty close. And when you consider that the, the max drawdown, so Taking your maximum equity and seeing how far you fell since that maximum point is nearly 900,000 on that one, it's 300,000 on this one, and you end up almost at the same place. If you gave me the choice between the two of those, I would personally pick the one where I'm standing to lose significantly less from peak to trough, and I'll probably go with the 1.5% risk. Again, monthly standard deviation, a measure of risk, you're risking less in theory as a, as a general proxy, that sharp ratio is again improved, 1%. And what I really want to draw your attention to is the fact that these final equity numbers, with the exception of the 0.5%, which I admit is very, very conservative, they're remarkably close. But that maximum drawdown figure is less than half of what it would be if we risk 1.5% of our account on a per trade basis. The maximum equity, again, it's, it's half the level, sure you stand to lose less, but we practically end up at the same place and we're, we're doing it with much less peak to trough risk. 0.5% least sexy, I know. But what I do want to draw your attention to is the fact that this is, the, this is a strategy that had the best risk adjusted returns when you measure the volatility of those returns versus the final equity versus what you theoretically would have made in the end. So again, I'm not trying to tell you like risk X percent of your account, but do be aware that, especially if you are trading something like the RSI strategy, which again, I picked the RSI for a reason. I think it's a great proxy for what our traders actually do. It's remarkably streaky. And sometimes you can get on a roll and sometimes you can get final equity, like $1.2 million starting at 100K. That's fantastic. But sometimes, you know, right next to it, you see the maximum drawdown of 1.26 million. And all of a sudden you start seeing, okay, well, with higher risk, or with, with higher reward comes higher risk by necessity, and it might not be worth that risk. So you need to be aware of what using leverage means in your account and risking percentages of your account on a per trade basis in conjunction with money management. And you know, again, I, I like to look at everything I've covered today in, in not in isolation, but just in conjunction with one another, because once you get one piece of the puzzle, you can add it to the next, and in my opinion, really increase your chances of success. Obviously, the, the risk disclaimer is always there. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Please keep that squarely in mind. And you know, I, even, even with the hypothetical back test, which again, we're, we're programmed with the benefit of hindsight, even within the back test, you saw that something that worked fantastically well up to 2010 did really poorly. So if we started this in 2010, I would say, oh, well, the RSI strategy has been fantastic, but it's no guarantee of future results. You know, it's right there. In sum, I want you to recognize the strategy's weaknesses because if you do trade like this, you do expose yourself to significant streakiness in performance. What I mean is that the RSI strategy, and if you're a range trader, this, you'll probably follow this, this same profile, obviously no absolutes, but as a general proxy for what range traders actually do, the RSI, in my opinion, is pretty great. The RSI strategy tends to be extremely streaky. It either does well for a long time or does really poorly. So once you know that, 
you know to, to say that you don't want to risk too much of your account at the same time because those losses are cumulative and you can wipe your account out really fast. Same time, recognize your strengths. Sometimes that works in your favor. Sometimes being on a winning streak works and you can you know, really do some damage to the top side if you do catch a winning streak. Much harder said than done. But at the same time, you know, leverage isn't all about risk. Sometimes you do actually stand to make a profit but you don't know when that's going to happen, so you really need to fine-tune that knowing where, where the strategy is likely to do well and managing risk accordingly. Adapt to risk, different risk profiles. It's just like what I just said. At, at the end of the day, you need to know what the, the, the general risk profile is going to be for your strategy and then adapt to that and adapt to what it's been doing recently. I think that's a big part of it. And limit maximum losses while maximizing profits. I mean, that, that goes back to my first presentation of the day, money management. The biggest mistake Forex traders make, money management. Letting profits, cutting profits short, letting losses run, biggest mistake. So even before you, you think about leverage, you have to think about what you stand to gain versus what you stand to lose. Finally, seek the best risk-adjusted returns, not absolute returns. So those equity curves I showed earlier, some of those look pretty fantastic, especially when you, you saw maximum equity of theoretically up to $1.2 million. Problem is, when you, you looked at it on a risk-adjusted basis, significantly less attractive. So in my opinion, looking at things in that kind of light, you know, what am I risking to get my reward is really the best way to go about it because, again, you don't know when that strategy is going to go on that winning streak necessarily. So you want to get the best risk-adjusted returns how much do I stand to lose if I leverage this much? How much do I stand to gain? So that's the presentation. I thank you again for coming out, and hopefully you got something out of that. Thank you.